Good evening, and thank you, as Pyle said, for being here in such wonderful numbers uh, before all of you fly away to cooler climes for the summer. Uh, there's always, of course, Nina, Shuli, Ritu, and Anjali who joined Pyle and me in welcoming all of you here today. You know, it's uh, wonderful that we've kind of reached the mid-year uh, of algebra this year with the kind of people and conversations that we've churned. By my book, Not Enough of Politics, because it's been such a politically hot uh, half a year. And when you're back, I really hope you will turn up in this many numbers without us enticing you with uh, the glamour end of the world, which is Bollywood and cinema, but that you will turn up in these kind of numbers uh, for politics and economy and some of the other social impact issues that we'd love to discuss with all of you. Today, it's wonderful to have the kind of lineup we do because in the past couple of weeks, we've repeatedly heard from different corners the, the phrase that democracy is in danger. And this is not just a political ping pong ball between warring parties, but we've had the four judges, you know, in an unprecedented way coming out to tell pretty much in the history of the country, this has not happened, to say that really they feel democracy is in danger. And given that they sit in the absolute citadel of democracy, which is the Supreme Court, that is definitely a warning note that we need to take seriously. The reason I'm bringing this up is that very often artists are the other custodians of what is liberal and humane and plural in societies. Emile Zola once uh, famously went to jail for standing up for a very unpopular case, a man called Alfred Dreyfus. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with him, but he was a Jewish French officer uh, who was accused of being a spy. And largely out of the kind of hatred of Jews, there was absolutely no fair trial and he was put away in an island. And Emile Zola, amongst others, but as a writer, was someone who fought that unpopular battle so hard and so fiercely that he went to jail for it. Closer home, a couple of evenings ago, we had Javed Saab at Taj Man Singh talking about the subversive edge of Urdu uh, poetry and how many poets and writers have gone to jail, again, standing up for the values that we have come together as a democracy for. A man called Zatala in the 16th century put to jail, uh, you know, for speaking up against uh, the Mughal kings uh, and, and in fact ultimately hanged. The reason I'm saying all this is because our first speaker today, Debakar Banerjee, is not somebody who's really dying to go to jail, but he is somebody who definitely thinks of the artist as being someone driven by an idea of anger and protectiveness about society. Uh, his films, of course, are you know, the, the national award-winning films, Kosla Ka Gosla, uh, Oye, Oye, Oye Lucky Oye, there's Shanghai, there's Love, Sex, or Dhoka, there's Bomkesh Bakshi. And it's very edgy, it's, it's brought a kind of new grittiness to what we call mainstream cinema. But the conversation we're going to have today is really more the imagination behind the creative landscape. What creates Dibakar, what triggers his impulse, and what is he worrying about as an artist in society? And why is that anger so important for all of us? So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Debakar Banerjee. Thank you. So Debakar, I've set you up for jail. I hope you've uh, kind of all geared up, your, pa your bags are packed and you're ready to go. And you're gonna give us a conversation that's gonna land you straight in the heart today. <laughs> You know, I don't even want to joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me start, um, Debakar, with this idea of anger in the first place, you know, of, of an artist. A uh, couple of years ago, you know, when the whole FTII um, re revolt of the students against uh, Gajendra Chauhan was at its peak and you returned your national award, you said that you were feeling part of a society that can no longer think freely, speak freely, or perhaps even live freely in India. Do you still feel that two years later? Or has some of that anger eased or has it got exacerbated? I was actually saying something slightly different. So let me just correct myself as to what I was saying. I mean, especially when we were talking about the FTII uh, thing. I think what I was talking about was that when the FTII issue came up, to me it was very clearly an education issue. And you can take any sides on that. That is not what we will discuss today here. 
that we leave for the WhatsApp uh, messages. So I think uh, it was very clear to me right in the beginning that this was an educational issue because I've been to a very, uh, two, two very thrilling educational institutes. One, my own very own Bal Bharti Public School in Delhi, which in fact has been funded and run by a body whose political thought would be construed to lie in the right. Uh, but because of that, my Hindi and Sanskrit are much better than any of, many of the people sitting here. Because we had uh, math in Hindi till class 5. Uh, we had Sanskrit till class 10. You're good in Hindi, but are you good at math? <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that was one institute where I spent all 12 years of my life. Everything that I did had two sources. One home, I saw my mother sing, so I would be into music. I saw my father play the flute, so I would be into music. I saw my sister read something, I would start try and read that. So that's an influence that all of us have at home. At school, I was debating, quizzing, uh, painting, uh, uh, doing all sorts of things, and from class 4 till class 12th, it was a non-stop ride. I, I was actually hardly in, ever in my class. I think that paved the way for who I am today, or how I operate today. My second institute was National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad. Of course, I was chucked out of there. I couldn't finish it. But for two and a half years, I was at a place where the best resources on graphic design, art, culture, history, aesthetics, sociology, politics. There was nothing that was out of my reach in the library. It had nothing to do with design. We just had a kick-ass library, that's all. And we used to see films, which normal people in the 90s wouldn't even dream of seeing. I mean, I saw Blade Runner on a 35 millimeter print. I mean, if there are any film aficionados, you know how rare that is. I mean, not to see it on a DVD, but to see it on a big screen. I mean, Blade Runner director's cut. So that's the kind of exciting time that I've been through. And uh, I really value uh, an educational institute. And during the FTII uh, issue, a lot of people kept asking me, Ke Bollywood ka is pe kya, you know, uh, comment hai, or aap to Bollywood se hai, or aap kya soch te and I kept trying to tell them that it's not a Bollywood issue, it's an education issue. It just happens to be filmmaking that we are talking about, and it's just, I just happen to be a filmmaker. Had you done it to an education institute which teaches accountancy or public law, and had I been a lawyer, I would have spoken about that. That's all there was. And my worry is not that we are not a free society, and my worry is not that we are, the I mean, democracy is being endangered, or the space to speak is reducing. Every society has gone through its own proscription, and democracy, just by the nature of being democracy, whatever it is, that's another debate, is always in danger. It's always in danger. So that's not the issue. The issue here is that the larger body of citizens of India who pretty much are like us, who have a fair access or nominal access or little more than nominal access to English, which is the lingua franca of the privileged and the elite, uh, who come from middle classes, who are not terribly deprived like a large part of India's population who have had some kind of an education and are holding some kind of employment and are trying to groom their children to become citizens who are at least at their level or even ahead of them in terms of their connectedness with the zeitgeist of this thing we call India. And what I feel much more appalling than the danger to democracy or the danger to anything else is that, uh, sorry, what I find more fearsome is uh, 
that not many people cared, not many parents cared, not many students cared, and not many teachers cared. And in any other time, in any other age, a similar problem may have happened with any other educational institute. But what saves the society is the no said at the right time at the right numbers. So, uh, and that we are not doing. Okay. So I'm, I'm, you know, you've, you've kind of located, narrowed this down to an educational issue, and, and it's important you do that. Uh, before I ask you, you know, to expand on why at that time it was framed as a, a debate around intolerance, and, and my first question to you was that the anxiety you felt then, is that exacerbated or not? But before that, I just wanted to share an interesting detail about uh, Debakar with all of you, which is that, you know, he's talking about the NID library and, and the song and the literature in his parents' home, but he's forgotten to talk about the truly, uh, the, the seminal moment in his life was that he and his friends, when they were about 16 or 17, uh, were, 14 is it, okay, at 14, uh, had gone to ask for a porn film called The Confessions of a Taxi Driver. And by mistake, they were given Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver instead. <laughs> and so they ended up watching that, and that uh, ended up being a very influential moment in Debakar's life, and that's what shaped him, not the library of NID. <laughs> so not only in my life, actually, I was sitting there with uh, my friends who were still there, functioning as fathers and family members and businessmen and entrepreneurs. And we were all sitting there, and they were all, sorry to indulge in some cultural stereotype here, they were not angsty bongs like me. They were very well-adjusted and very tall and well-built North Indian boys. So they sat with me, and we were all waiting for confessions of a taxi driver to come on with a room which was extremely darkened, and it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we had told my friend's mom, whose house had the only VCR between us, and that's why we sort of went there, and we told her that, you know, we are watching, we are working. So, and then Taxi Driver came on, and it came on, and it finished, but uh, <laughs> after that, my friend Vipul Gupta, he kept staring at the TV for some time, and he said, Sai picture di, yaar. <laughs> Sai picture di. So, again, coming back to what I was answering, the first time that if Vipul Gupta can respond to a taxi driver from Brooklyn, then there is no reason that uncle and auntie Chadha from Asansol can, cannot react to an educational institute in Pune or in Calcutta being reduced to a reductionist state. Sure. But, you know, when, when you made the FTI into a film and you said if this was happening to an accountancy education uh, institution or a, a lawyer's institution, then the lawyers would speak up. So in that sense, you're kind of reducing it down to that particular community. No, but no, but, no. but you're, so you're basically saying that you wanted people to speak up much more, to get engaged much more Actually, than they were doing. I was trying to broaden it. I was saying that it's, I mean, you're talking about a film. Why are you only worried about Bollywood? Why are you not worried about the fact that this is an educational institute? And how an educational institute should actually... You know, if, you know the, what, ha what happens in a classroom? What's the first thing that happens in a classroom? Your brain is opened up? Y yeah, <laughs> finally. Finally, okay. No. Uh, first, I don't know. Uh, I haven't been in a classroom for a long time. You feel scared? No, I, I, just just a verb. Just give me a part of the verbal discourse. What's the most common, the most commonly found part of verbal discourse that happens in a class? What does the teacher do to the student? What does the teacher say to the uh, the, the 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 teacher? It's a question, right? A question is the fundamental yeah. fundamental unit of educational discourse or any kind of discourse. But when and again, I'm coming back, and I'm trying to get back from the much more salacious and nicely entertaining aspect of me being a film director and giving you all anecdotes. I'm again trying to draw it back to what I was trying to say, that how can, an edu how, how, how can we as a society agree to the disappearing of questions 
especially in the context of an educational institute? How can we operate without questions? Sure. No, and, and that's why that, that speaking up at that time was very important, returning the awards. Uh, you know, many people came together to do that. That was very important. It's much like the, the judges coming out and speaking now. You know, different uh, parts of our society are feeling moved to take very extreme positions and stands, clearly because there is a lot of a sense of unrest, a heating of waters that is bothering people. So uh, again, to come back, Debakar, to that first question I asked you, you know, when we were discussing what you would like to talk about today, you really were saying about this kind of subterranean emotion that's driving you right yeah, now, yeah. Uh, which is a sense of not just anger, but of almost fear, uh, a sense of alienation. Yeah. I'm asking you again, two years later, you know, that was the last time you were really out there in public taking a stand. What is it today that is worrying you and distressing you? And is it more exacerbated than two years ago? or? Is it more calm now? I just said it. I mean, it's not exacerbated. It's not calmer. It's just becoming. I mean, anyway, I'll, I'll come to that a little later. What I was saying that I just said that what worried me then was that it made me feel extremely lonely. You see, there's a confession. We did the sort of, you know, award wapsy after the FTI thing with a clear view to grab the attention of the parents and the students and the citizens of India who are interested in education. That's all. I mean, at one point, you can only fight so much. But uh, at the end of it, I think we, I, I think at the end of it, we found that people didn't care that much. So two years down, two years now, now, I feel lonelier. But I also feel like that uncle who says, I told you so. You know, every time, you know, I do something, my mother would say, Bujbi, Bujbi, which in Bengali means you'll understand one day. So, and I have seen lots of my, you know, elders who've told me later, I told you so, young man, do not go there in those trousers, you know, you'll be laughed out or whatever it is. So today, after two years, I feel like that angry uncle at this tender age who goes on saying, I told you so, I told you so, and you didn't listen then, and now you're telling me this. What the frick did you expect? So, Abhi, if you want me to say, no, no, it's very bad, or it's this and that, I would love to say it. But I want to say that, what's new? And where were you two years ago? And where were you, and what did you do to a certain amount of appropriation of your living space two years ago? You didn't say anything. You thought, ah, yeah, this is nothing. This is just, you know, rabble rousing. This is this, this is. And I'm not even talking about anti-national, national, and all that. Those are that's a that's a political gambit. So I mean, I don't think I think we are discussing something bigger than that. So I feel, you know, I feel, uh, you know, I almost feel some kind of satisfaction. You know, you know, it's have you, you you're a parent. You know, I told you this would happen. You know, I feel that. If you're really asking me honestly. So, Am I being coherent? We'll have to ask the audience that. <laughs> Is he being coherent? <laughs> no. uh, but the Bakar, you know, so again, because we are somewhat restricting this conversation about being an artist in society, uh, because that's who you are, that, uh, you know, you're right about speaking about the silence, the, lack of, the sense of disengagement that, and you defined it as particularly the elite uh, have about what's going on. But, you know, it's, it's interesting to see, say, in, in Trump's America, uh, how much of both the media and the cinema world, the artistic world, the, the literary world, yes. is standing up and speaking. You know, there is a sense of a pushback. Yes. Uh, do you feel that that is happening at all within the industry, within the cinema industry and the artistic community in India uh, now? I will, I don't care about the cinema industry and the artistic community, so I will not answer questions about that. I'm bigger than that. So, so I, I thought you were afraid of going to Tihar jail. I didn't think you were afraid of even speaking about your fraternity. No, no, my fraternity, though, I don't, I don't think anybody will, have, will be at any risk of going anywhere if one starts talking about Bollywood. Because it's the most harmless, it's the most, most harmless poodle in the room. So there's no discussion about that. That's, that let's not go there. Uh, I feel that, uh, since you were saying that, has there been 
what is the artistic and the Bollywood community feel and all that. Uh, we always had to negotiate our way through various prescriptions. That's not the point. The point that I'm trying to make is that when the, the class that's meant to ask questions is submerged neck deep in power and celebrity worship, and when you try and change the discourse, and then you're asked, why are you being a nuisance? Or you're ignored. Or you're actively you know, uh, persecuted. Then who do you look to help for? You really don't look for help towards the person who's persecuting you. Why? He's, he's doing his job. He's, he's, he's doing his dharma. You look for help from that class which you thought you belonged to. You see, I uh, had a nasty surprise in late 87, 88 when the Mandal uh, thing happened. Because you see, our textbooks, I don't know how many of you were born in the early 70s, our textbooks actually told us and taught us that we are caste free, correct? Our Bollywood songs told us that we are caste free. Jat Pat nahi hai, kuch nahi. Now, what happened in 87, 88 was that as I started reading and I just, I was 17, 18 at that point, I realized that a large part of the electoral math is based on caste. And I'm trying to make you understand what a rude shock it is to a bubble boy living in his civics books come to this reality of caste politics and then realizing that, okay, either I've been had or I've been lied to or I'm a fool. And then you spent a few years trying to come to terms with the fact that you don't know enough, you're a fool you're being a nuisance or whatever, and then you start realizing that this is what's gone wrong. So I felt the same even when I was in Bollywood, but I'm enough of a hustler to hustle my way through to get funding for my film and make my films, and you have to do that. And even when we did films like Khosla or Oye Lucky or Love, Sex or Dhoka, I had to go through my sensory issues or whatever. So I am actually talking about the fact that at that time I thought that if things go bad, then there'll be enough protesting. No, there aren't enough. And secondly, the institutions of protest are not there. The institutions of protest, the formations of protest, the discourse of protest does not exist. Because when you protest, all you end up doing is embarrass your decent uncle. Now, what do you do? So you become a chavacha. He's a very good boy. And then you get a call, why are you doing these things? I mean, you've got children now. I, I, I mean, it happened. I mean, I didn't know. But so that's what happens. So you are forever the bad boy or forever the, oh, ho, 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 he's like that. And believe me, you've also called me today to some extent, because I know that you and I have had a chat and I know that you agree on a lot of things that I'm saying. And you're not just, uh, you know, whatever. But you've also called me here because I'm a, a chat trick monkey. The Bakar, that is so no, unfair. No, 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 no. So, so the thing is, <laughs> I won't say anything overtly political because I apparently am a filmmaker. Who's a filmmaker? A harmless idiot who gives you stories with some kind of a political or social, you know, leavening to it. But I can't make any political statements, so I'm not a Jignesh Mewani. So therefore, I don't have the ammo to actually tell you what's happening in India or what's happening uh, in our discourse. So I'm only telling you about what I feel inside in my bubble world. But let me tell you, two years ago, three years ago, I knew this was coming. And therefore, I feel like that uncle where I keep telling everybody that now you're looking at me very surprised. Oh, God, democracy is being endangered. <coughs> the now, why now? Just, just in the on, just in the service of truth, I must say that I absolutely uh, resist him saying that we invited him here as a trick monkey because we were really inviting here, him here to talk about his edgy cinema. And no, 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 just, just hold on. And uh, he specifically said, "Don't talk to me about my body of work. It's too small. I really want to talk about the state of the nation." And you know, this is how you get fucked on stage and people make love to you in the green room. You know, <laughs> because this just happened to me. 
two days ago at Taj Man Singh, Indira Jai Singh called me a status quoist. And today she's called me and she said, you know, I really want to have a cup of coffee with you and I want to answer those questions that you were asking me that day. So this is really the secret life of the moderator. You know? uh, no, I completely agree. <laughs> uh, no, actually, a lot of it comes out of a very... Uh, and I think we should talk about that. A lot of it comes out of a very shared chat about both you and I had, and in this case, you're the moderator, but we were kind of reflecting the same alien, alienation. But I have to put words to it. That's all I'm trying to say sure. from my own. So I, I just want to move away, uh, Debakar, a little bit to, again, this idea of being, you know, a voice in society. That you were also expressing discomfort, you know, when we call you an edgy director or a gritty director. You were saying that all of these uh, identities, all of these images become a trap. And, you know, at other times you've said that part of being a rebel is to know when to conform. So can you give us some sense of, you know, how you have negotiated this of wanting to have a voice, of wanting to, you know, where that edginess comes from and what have been your compromises? And the reason I'm asking this is because really today when, uh, you know, we know or at least I'm speaking for myself that I know what kind of forces that I would like to resist, which are Hindutva forces, which are communal forces. But I also find that there is a lot of complacency on the side of the liberals and the and people who think of themselves as the do-gooders. There's a kind of self-righteousness, all of which is very wor worrying, you know, because what is caught in between is just uh, the idea of um, of of just humane complex discourse. So how do you negotiate this, you know, of buying into that image of yourself or of conforming just enough to still exist? <clears throat> a bit panic, actually. With a, with a, with a, with a never-ending sense of panic. I'll just explain that. Uh, I think I started making films to become famous and make money. Uh, uh, protesting about something or something didn't enter my head. It's just that when I started making my films, I realized that I was touching upon subjects, at least which I had experienced, and there was some amount of anger. I mean, even Khosla Ka Khosla is actually uh, the anger of a typical Brexiter at seeing his father being insulted by a neoliberal, you know, metropolitan. That's what. Uh, Khosla ka Khosla is and Oila ki is whatever, whatever, whatever. So I realized that I was operating out of anger. There you're right. And just today, I was having a chat with my niece, and she's 26, and she told me that, Mama, you have a lot of anger in you. And she didn't mean it as praise. So, uh, yes, it started with anger, but I wasn't aware of it. I thought that I wanted to make money, and I wanted to be famous, and I wanted to be a filmmaker. Things started changing, little bit, little bit, little bit. I started growing older. Whatever happens, happens. So that's what happened. But ultimately, what happened was that I was being seen as somebody who was dark and edgy or whatever it is. Uh, because somebody would say, oh, you're dark. Your, your film is dark. So I realized that just because I was not trying to uh, only sort of show an imagined world, pretending to be a real world, but to show the real world and then take it forward through imagination, the same root surprise that you're reading your civic books and you think caste does not exist and suddenly you realize that only caste exists, you know? So you try and depict that root shock and then you're told that you're dark. So I started getting panicky. A lot of people sort of patronized me, they advised me. Now when I made Khosla Ka Khosla, I was told that I was a Rishikesh Mukherjee or something like that. So I quickly ran away from there and I made Oye Lucky Lucky Oye. My own brother-in-law called me up and said, it's a very shady film. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, and he wasn't commenting about the lighting. <laughs> so, so, so it started from there. Love, Sex or Dhoka, my own sister said, I'm only watching it because you're my brother. Why couldn't you make a film like, why couldn't you make a film like Three Idiots? So, uh, Shanghai happened, a producer of mine, a very well-wishing producer friend of mine, called up somebody else, and he called me back and said, Aap ki film dekhi, dekhi maine. Aap sham benigal route pe to nahi ja rahe ho thoda. So, wo bhi hua. So, basically what happens is that you start worrying about your children's education. Ultimately, that's all you're worried about. EMI kahan se aega? 
बच्चों का फी कहां से आएगा उनको अच्छे स्कूल वूल में बेसिकली बिकम आंटी एंड अंकल चड्ढा ना सो दैट्स व्हाट यू स्टार्ट वरीइंग अबाउट एंड देन यू ट्राई एंड बैलेंस इट बिकॉज़ यू कांट लिव आई मीन आई हैवंट मेड एनी अदर फिल्म्स ओनली दोस काइंड ऑफ फिल्म्स आई हैव राइट नाउ मेड अ फिल्म एंड आई एम अबाउट टू गो एंड मेक अ फिल्म व्हिच विल किल मी जस्ट टू ट्राई एंड गेट इट रिलीज्ड लेट्स सो सो we'll see we'll see what happens about that so i can't even change that so i mean i'm fucked either ways you know i mean i mean i mean so koi matlab koi koi chara nahi so i deal with it with constant panic constant fear constant survival uh, strategy and uh, what happens is that all your imaginary sustenances have been driven away your parents are old now they can't tell you what's wrong with the world and they can't make sense of it your children are asking questions so you're the only one who can tell them what the world is really supposed to be your friend is the one who has a muslim name and has therefore been denied on very benign grounds the rent lease of a flat in bombay and then you realize since you said you would like to speak up for you know anti hindutva or whatever 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 you're saying and then you realize that hindutva anti hindutva right left all kinds of discourses are welcome but the fact is that in your own family and in your own clan and with your own friends that you've lived with for 40 45 years there's suspicion of muslims now where do i file that away i can look at some rabbit hindutva sort of uh, uh, politician and say oh he's the he's the root of all evils but what happens to my friend that friend who loves his children who i have shared so many happy moments with who i have shared whiskey who i have shared my tall tales with you know we've hugged together and cried when he says something which reeks of a lifelong and constant suspicion of another community where your books are saying and everything all the discourse around you is saying that no they are the same we are all the same and then your own friend who advised you on how not to alienate your girlfriend and you followed that advice and you basically held on to your girlfriend so he's a good guy right he knows about shit and when you see him with that kind of an attitude where do you go where do you file that away so therefore you're suspicious about everybody and everyone and this is the gift of the last 3 years that we have become how small fortresses of fear and suspicion and we are scared to talk to each other because we don't know which way things will turn when so i'm again uh, interested to know the the bakar that you know you you spoke about even oi lucky lucky and your first khosla ka ghosla even that being driven by a sense of anger and alienation so again i'd i'd love this clarified because i think there are people who feel that there is a kind of exaggeration about the state of the nation today uh, that this is uh, you know that it's a more sort of political thing that people are viscerally anti bjp so the question i'd like to ask you is that is this just your temperament you know if you felt this oi lucky lucky it was not uh, made during a time when the bjp was in power it wasn't that this regime was in power you were already feeling alienated and angry so again is that your temperament is that uh, just who you are or is what you're feeling today very distinctive of the time that we are living in no i don't think that it's become any better from when i was making uh, oi lucky khosla or whatever and i think the problem is far bigger than bjp congress i mean i wish i had better news for you guys today it's much better bigger than that i think it's going to get worse before it gets better and uh, i also think that the mix of feudalism caste consumerism jiska bachcha main hu it's such a potent and poisonous mix that i have at least another 20 or 15 years of good solid poisonous anger to make films out of it's going to get worse before it gets better i'm sorry i mean i i'm not i'm not a cassandra i'm i'm not I, i'll not do that at all but what i'm seeing 2004 2005 me and my friends and my wife and you know people who used to talk together 
we used to talk about one thing that listen, look at this elite class of us and what we are doing and look at what's happening over there. Rising prices, le lo, ye le lo, wo le lo, kuch bhi le lo. And then we used to say, okay, now this glass wall will break and something will happen. And in my mind, very interestingly, I had some kind of a social avalanche of the sweaty masses breaking through and sweeping the elite aside kind of a phenomenon. I hadn't imagined that it could be channeled through this. Now having seen Brexit and Trump and what's happening in India and whatever, everything that we did wrong in 90s and in the early 2000s has come back to bite us in the ass. It's just that we hadn't expected it to be like this. But we need to identify it beyond just the Hindutva issue. It's much bigger than that. It's much more complex than that. And if we don't grapple with that, we won't be able to grapple with any of the subsets successfully. So, you know, you, you've mentioned uh, patriarchy and feudalism and, and consumerism uh, are there, and caste. You know, would you take these as the big pieces? Is it unemployment in general? Is it the development agenda? Mm. You know, what, again, if you were to break this down and remove it from the BJP, Congress kind of binary, uh, what, what else would you speak about? I say, I'm a filmmaker. Dibakar, we've gone over that ground. <laughs> Your credentials have been established now. You know? Very so, quickly, because I can see no, Pyle picking no, up no, the curve. No, this is truly, I'll be, I'll be venturing into uncharted territory. I don't clearly know the answer to this. What I can say is that, yes, absolutely, it's that. And um, you see, with a country like India, which has got a resource crunch, it'll always be, we have a resource crunch. That's our fundamental problem. And we have a distribution issue. All the professors of JNU will, will probably sort of, you know, uh, tell me that you are going to say, but we have a distribution issue. So in a hugely unequal society, first of all, that unequalness has been brought about by caste. Yeah. Across religions, because a caste system, any anthropologist in India will tell you the caste system works across all religions. It's a uniquely Indian system. In that, we are truly Indian. Sure. Yeah. So if so, that caste system gives us the wherewithal to create a humongous inequality. And uh, we'll have to decimate caste. So I'm just, you know, uh, before she, she yeah. has rung the bell, so, but this is one question that I just want to ask you because again, pertains to creativity and, and everything that we've been discussing that part of it is, part of the way you've managed to keep your work close to who you are mm. is about your relationship with money. How has that changed? You said that you worry about your children and EMI, but how does money and your creativity speak with each other? What, have, what decisions have you made which allow you to do the work that you've See, you it's again the schizophrenia. I mean, when you grow up as a middle-class boy in India, basically you are pumped full of those dreams of, uh, you know, upper middle class affluence in an urban Indian uh, sort of uh, circumstances. So uh, you live with that for so long as a family heritage that you have to go for it. And then when you go for something totally different, uh, you can't have it. So it's, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I can think of a thousand metaphors, but all of them would be obscene. So forget that. So. Uh, try, I mean, the, try the mildest one. So, so, <laughs> so, so uh, that, uh, that, that cognitive dissonance... Cognitive dissonance? Come up with the bad... Say the obscene metaphor, that's Conti better. No, no, no. no. <laughs> come on, come on. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elite gathering over here. But, but anyway, so, so, so you live with that and you manage that. But the fact is that uh, uh, the fear comes because in an unequal society, it takes five minutes literally five minutes for you to turn from elite and privileged to absolutely persecuted and damned. It'll take five minutes. The situation changes. You're on the wrong street. You're on the wrong place at the wrong time. And you can go from there to there. So my policy is that to pick the fights that I have to fight, otherwise, hold my counsel. I'm, I'm, I'm doing very badly at it, though, but I'm trying. Well, thank you, Dibakar. We've, we've uh, run out of time. You know, each time we have guests here, we feel that we should have had only that guest for the evening. Uh, but thank you very much for being here.
I'd uh, just like to share about, uh, you know, about Debakar that one other thing that we spoke about was, uh, you know, this constant conflict with who you want to be as an individual and also being trapped in your role in, in many other ways, you know, in society, but within the family, within uh, your roles as a father or as, as uh, a director responsible for others, and that voice within yourself, which is constantly seeking articulation. Uh, one of the reasons why Debakar was very keen to come here and speak was to try and remind all of us to stay as faithful as we can to that individual voice within all of us, uh, outside of any other entrapment in which we may find ourselves. One, of course, is of being an artist in society and speaking up just short of being led to Tihar jail from Taj Vivanta. <laughs> in an I told you so uncle, I told you so uncle way, of course. You know. <laughs> so. Thank you very, very much, Debakar. Thank you. <laughs>